Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this, the next panel, a panel about patient safety in perioperative medicine. This has much to do with anesthesiology, of course, and um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm honored and I'm, uh, it's a pleasure for me to moderate this panel together with uh, my colleagues. Um, <clears throat> I should have used the prompt, of course. First, I would like to start by telling you about two patients and two young physicians. Well, let's travel back in time um, more than a, a hundred years to find the first of our two patients lying on an operating table and in the middle of a, an operating theater, an old-fashioned surgical amphitheater in Massachusetts General Hospital in, in Boston. Um, so this patient is waiting to be anesthetized and to be operated. <clears throat> and from the seats of this surgical amphitheater uh, up there, a young surgical trainee at the time is called down to, to put the patient to sleep. <clears throat> Harvey Cushing is his name. And at the time, he is called a junior house pupil. That's their title. So this young surgical trainee is, is coming down and is starting his work. And as he later reports, and I'm quoting him now, is, I proceeded as best I could under the orderly's directions. So the operation was started. There was a sudden great gush of fluid from the patient's mouth, most of which he inhaled, and he died. So this is 100 years ago. The patient died right there on the operating table from a condition we call massive aspiration under the hands of a young surgical trainee, unexperienced, and during the procedure. So Harvey Cushing and his friend, Amory Cotman, another young surgeon-to-be, were shocked by this and, and by other fatal mishaps they experienced as, as trainees. But they were told that such events were frequent and inevitable. So, in other words, they could not be prevented. But as young physicians or surgeons-to-be, Harvey Cushing and Amory Cotman could not accept this status quo. <clears throat> they decided to improve their anesthetic skills, surgeons improving their anesthetic skills. They started on their own to train their technique to um, observe their patients much more closely and to document their observations. Thereby, they developed one of the first anesthetic records in history called uh, ether charts at the time. So as Harry Cushing later reported, they both became very much more skillful and thereby they pushed the limits of what can be prevented much to the benefit of their patients. Um, Harvey Cushing, as many of you probably know, uh, later became a very famous neurosurgeon, and Amory Cartman became a well-known surgeon as well. But most of all, he be became one of the fathers of quality improvement in healthcare in the United States. And he promoted the idea um, that the improvement of care should be based on patient outcomes which he, at the time, called end results. So, and you know, we have been talking about that yesterday. He published the results of his own surgical practice. He ran a little surgical private clinic in Boston, including his own errors, a couple of hundreds of errors, and five fatalities. And you can imagine that not many of the hospitals he invited to um, do the same, actually followed his invitation. And he later died impoverished. 
So you can read all of that and much more in Michael Millicent's book, Demanding Medical Excellence, and in a couple of papers I'm, I'm happy to share with you. But you may ask, why consider these things, these things that have happened a long time ago? <clears throat> I'll come back to this in just a moment. <clears throat> but <clears throat> in the meantime, let's travel back in time to, to the present. Remember Mrs. K, uh, the second patient that Stefan de Heert has presented in his talk. So since the times of Cotman and Cushing, the intraoperative period and anesthesia have become very safe. Not 100%, of course, I know, but very safe. But complications continue to occur and they occur in the postoperative period. <clears throat> and <clears throat> Sorry to check my notes. And most of all, or most importantly, 50% of them are thought to be preventable. That is probably why anesthesiologists have expanded their role beyond the operating room, to um, intensive care, for example, and to pain management. And this room of improvement that is still there, because 50% of them are preventable, is also a reason that we should reflect on what we can learn from history. First of all, I think just every single preventable patient death is one too many and must be remembered even after a hundred years. And second, um, as the example of these young surgeons shows, humans are not only prone to error and part of the problem, but they can also become part of the solution by their ability to be compassionate, by their ability to oppose a general acceptance of fatal mishaps as something inevitable, and to work hard to find solutions and share them with others. The European Society of Anesthesiology, uh, together with the European Board of Anesthesiology and together with other partner organizations, has created a tool that allows or that helps to become part of the solution. The Helsinki Declaration on Patient Safety in Anesthesiology. This is a very practical framework of safety requirements for anesthesia departments. And by this declaration, by education, by science and research, by clinical guidelines, as Stefan de Heert has already uh, told you, and by developing the professional role of anesthesiologists, our society can support professionals to achieve our goal of eliminating preventable deaths and complications in our patients. And that's what our panel will be about, and may I invite my colleagues and panelists now to join me up here. Thank you for joining me here. I see I need still to introduce myself. <clears throat> uh, I, my name is Johannes Wacker. I'm chairing the Patient Safety and Quality Committee of the European Society of Anesthesiology, and I'm working as a consultant anesthesiologist in Zurich, Switzerland, at Heers London Clinic, a private hospital. And um, I think this is a very special group today here, if we compare it with yesterday's panels. We're all anesthesiologists. We're all engaged in the European Society of Anesthesiology. And I would like to invite you to um, send in your questions if you have any questions um, addressing anesthesiologists. So we're, uh, we're, we're happy to try to answer them. 
Um, may I ask the panelists to introduce uh, themselves? Maybe we, we, we'll start on the left side with Dr. Zev Goldig from Israel. Good morning. My name is Zev Goldig. I'm the uh, vice president, immediate past president of the European Society of Anesthesiology, and I am the head of the Anesthesia, Intensive Care and Pain Department in Haifa, Israel. And good morning, everybody. I'm Janneke Melin Olsen, an anesthesiologist from Norway, working there. I used to be the secretary of the European Society until the end of last year, and then I moved on to be the president-elect of the World Federation. Uh, but uh, I am lucky to still be allowed to be involved in the Patient Safety and Quality Committee of the ESA. Uh, good morning, I'm Andrew Smith. I'm a consultant anaesthetist in Lancaster, which is a small city in the northwest of England. I'm also privileged to direct a patient safety research unit funded by the UK <coughs> uh, National Institute of Health Research. I'm Dave Whitaker. I was a consultant on cardiac anaesthesia intensive care at Manchester Royal Infirmary. Uh, I've been involved in safety organisations for quite a long time. I'm currently the chair of the EBA Patient Safety Committee and I'm on the ESA Patient Safety and Quality Committee that uh, Johannes chairs. Yeah, thank you for your introductions. And I think um, the Helsinki Declaration is, of course, a core topic for our panel here. Um, Janneke, if we agreed on a ladies first, um, if you're very uh, active in patient safety and uh, like constantly on the move. Um, if you think about your own practice, could you tell us an example where you think that patient safety was really an issue and maybe the Helsinki Declaration would have been helpful? Yes, thank you. I would like to highlight uh, one part of the Helsinki Declaration that we have touched upon already here, and that's the role of patients and relatives. I have noticed that people that are uh, involved in patient safety, we are all special people. Most of us are very nice and we are reflective and we are want to make a change. And uh, I have noticed that for many of us there is this defining moment when this interest started. And I will share with you my defining moment. Uh, when I was three and a half years old, I had a brother, and he was born with an esophagus that ended blindly. And my mother knew at that time that if there was any chance for him to survive, she had to be with him in the hospital. But at that time, there was no childcare or anything, so I said, Mama, you go to be with him in the hospital, I look after my two-year-old sister. And she, she had no choice. So I was babysitting my sister for six months when I was three and a half to four years old. Then he went through several uh, operations and the surgeon said at one point that this tube through the abdominal wall into the, gas, uh, into the stomach was very hard to place. So this must not be taken out. And yeah, that's fine. I was sitting outside the hospital with my sister. My mother was inside with my brother. And uh, he had to go to surgery once again. And then my mother said, please remember, do not take out that tube. Dr. So-and-so said, it has to be in place. And then he was not there, so they just dismissed her. You know, those mothers, they are always pushy. So they took it out, they fought hard to get it back in again, they thought they had succeeded, but it went into the peritoneal cavity. And uh, they fed him and he developed peritonitis and he died. At that time, my childhood was over. I stopped playing, I didn't start playing again until I was grown up and now I have more money to play with. So that's uh, in some way a good thing. Uh, but, uh, but, um, I wanted to, I stopped playing and I just wanted to change, I wanted to make a difference and somehow that was when I decided to be a doctor and also to be involved in this uh, type of efforts. And my message is, well there are, there is such things as a difficult mother, but that's a diagnosis of exclusion. Always listen to, to relatives, to mothers and listen to what they have to say and work with them as part of the team. And that's what we are doing as anesthesiologists, working as, as a team 
and all stakeholders or all partners in that team are partners. And that's how I'm guided in my clinical life and also in, in my uh, organizational life too. We are all partners. That also includes um, the countries, you know, the European society. We are from less resourceful countries to very resourceful countries in Europe. We share experience, we share this, we do the Helsinki Declaration together to spread, to put everybody getting to a goal of minimal preventable harm. Thank you, Janneke, for this very personal example. And um, I think it, it also um, shows the value of the Helsinki Declaration as a tool, because this, what you mentioned, is part of the, of the Helsinki Declaration. Um, Jeff, uh, you're, besides all your functions, uh, your immediate past president of our society, you've all <coughs> always been very active in education. You know. Could you think of an example of your own clinical experience that shows both the importance of patient safety, maybe the Helsinki Declaration, and education? Yes, I, I want to give two examples. The first one, I was sitting at the pre-operative clinic with my patient and explaining to him what is anesthesia. And uh, he asked, uh, how dangerous is this operation and this anesthesia? How risky? And, of course, I used the classical comparison with aviation, and I said, I we will get, I'm the pilot, and I will uh, keep you safe in good condition. So he said, yes, doctor, but there is one big difference. At the flight, the pilot is flying together with me. So we were laughing, of course, and then when I went home, I was thinking, this he's not completely right because you know the phenomenon of the second victim when something goes wrong to us and we have a, a difficult case and something goes wrong so this can change our entire life and uh, yesterday a gentleman brought the example here in this country 27 uh, doctors committed suicide <coughs> after uh, difficult cases. The second example is uh, I had a patient for my private practice with allergy to latex, latex rubber. So uh, I committed the, the mistake to take such a difficult case <laughs> to private practice, but this is another story. So I, uh, I try to avoid all the uh, latex uh, components uh, in our operation, and I even decided to, to do a spinal anesthesia, only the uh, lower part of the, of the body. The operation was uneventful. It was a hernia operation, and then they took the patient to the recovery room, and they called me urgently that the patient uh, had a sudden drop in blood pressure and they, of course, we anticipated a, a anaphylactic uh, shock because of latex, so we could uh, save him, the patient, and uh, we realized that the cause of this anaphylaxis was they connected the patient to the pulse oximeter, which sensor is plastic outside, but inside it has a thin layer of rubber. So equipment is almost perfect these days. It's improving all the time, but the best equipment is not better than the person using it. So, uh, I think this, this is the, uh, the, uh, uh, the message 
we can take, that the equipment is becoming more and more perfect and is helping us a lot, but we have to concentrate more in the human errors. Which can be done by education, for example, <coughs> as I understand. For instance, uh, as Steph uh, the Hert said before, we, we uh, invest a lot of efforts at the European Society in uh, education. We have a European diploma, we have uh, master classes and uh, scientific uh, activities and research, of course. Thank you very much for this example, Zef. And um, David, Whitaker, mm -hmm. David, you have, you're very active in patient uh, safety uh, events and uh, initiatives as well. Mm -hmm. And by the way, by the way um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the three sitting next to each other, Yannicke, Andy, and David, have been very instrumental uh, in developing uh, the Helsinki Declaration on Patient Safety in Anesthesiology. David, uh, you've been quite active uh, in medication safety lately. Uh, you've been uh, part or maybe the driving force for the European Board of Anesthesiology recommendations on uh, safe medication use. Uh, could you give us an example uh, that involves medication safety we, we can learn from? Yes, I, I'd like to talk about uh, guidelines. The um, European uh, Journal of Anesthesia, which is society's journal, uh, this time last year published the uh, European Board recommendations for safe medication practice um, and this uh, and then a bit later on as we heard yesterday March the uh, WHO launched their uh, third global patient safety challenge so it was uh, very much in line with what's going on and um, I just uh, the guidelines were published just a simple two-page uh, simple recommendations and then to help implement them, which is the important thing with guidelines, there's a 13-point checklist that departments can use to help implement them. And I'd like to highlight the first guideline uh, recommendation, uh, which was that all syringes uh, used in routine anesthesia, critical care medicine, emergency medicine, and pain medicine should be clearly labeled. And uh, it's quite a simple recommendation. Perhaps I could just ask the audience, um, the show of hands, if you need an injection on Monday morning, would you want the uh, syringe to be clearly labelled? Yes! <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. So it's quite simple. Uh, but um, a number of uh, patients have suffered severe harm and died because unlabeled syringes have been used. And uh, to give you an example, um, in 2010, less than a mile from where we are here, a young 10-year-old girl had a uh, arterial venous malformation on her cheek, and this was going to be ablated. It was a cosmetic operation, and the, in the x-ray room, the doctor had two 10 mil syringes. One had uh, uh, x-ray contrast in, and the other had colors glue. And he got them mixed up, nobody spoke up, and he injected the glue into the girl's carotid artery. And she was blinded, one eye, severe brain damage, and she's going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. Um, and not only uh, was that catastrophic for her, but it resulted in the highest ever uh, NHS litigation payout of 24 million pounds. So when people tell me that unlabeled syringes are expensive, uh, I tell them that the two 10 mil syringes at Great Ormond Street Hospital cost, 12, cost the NHS 12 million pounds each. And uh, Throughout Europe, uh, hospitals still don't provide uh, the ISO colored labels for uh, all syringes to be labeled. And this is something that uh, you know, we'd like to work on uh, with the uh, global safety challenge uh, with the WHO and the patient safety movement. Thank you very much, David, for this uh, example. Not quite from anesthesia, but that goes far beyond anesthesia, probably also the uh, the contents of the guidelines published by the European Board of Anesthesiology. Um, so, uh, Andy, um, you're, besides your clinical uh, work as a consultant anesthetist, you're, you've always been very active in teaching, education, and in research. Right. 
Uh, so could you give us an example how, um, from your, your own experience or practice, mm -hmm. how um, research could be important for patient safety? Um, yeah, I mean, well, Yannick had talked about um, defining moments, didn't he? And I think um, one is a moment of revelation, really. And um, the thing that really comes to mind is a, an occasion um, when I was working as a trainee anaesthetist in a, a large teaching hospital, so this is a few years ago. And one of the theatre lists I was quite frequently rostered to work at was um, for the dental surgeons who are taking wisdom teeth out of, of otherwise healthy uh, young people. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I find that they, these young people were anxious about the surgery out of all proportion to the seriousness of the problem. I mean, it's a big operation for them, I suppose, but it's nothing to do with cancer or heart disease. It's not major life-threatening uh, operation. And um, typically, you'd be on the second or sometimes even the third syringe of anaesthetic to try and get them to sleep properly, when normally one is perfectly adequate. And I remember one particular occasion, there was a, a girl, a, a student at the local university, who was terrified when she came into hospital. This is for day case procedure, so she wasn't going to stay very long. And I tried to uh, explain what was going to happen in the anaesthetic room or what she'd be like afterwards. I tried to reassure her. <coughs> and uh, she came to the anaesthetic room, still very anxious. And we put the cannula in, we put the monitoring on. And having started the injection of anaesthetic, suddenly she sat bolt upright on the trolley and tried to clamber off it. And it was only the quick thinking of my anaesthetic assistant who managed to pull her back down, we got her safely to sleep, that uh, avoided her ending up in a heap on the floor. So when I got to do the list the following week, I thought I'd try and do something different and to make it more pleasant for the patients and certainly safer for the induction of anaesthesia, I, I prescribed them all a sedative pre-medication. And I was working my way along the list in the day case ward, uh, prescribing this on the chart, and I got to the last patient, and I could see sister on the ward uh, collecting the charts up and shaking her head and frowning. And she got to me and she said, you can't give them a pre-med doctor, we'd never get them out of, out of hospital on time. I thought, well, I tried to explain why I was doing it, but she, she was quite insistent, and so they didn't get the pre-meds that week. But what it did do was drive me to the library that evening, and I worked through the paper copies of Index Medicus, this obviously dates the story before it's electronic databases, and uh, to cut a long story short, I found uh, quite a number of research articles which showed that you could quite uh, easily give patients sedative premedications and, and not delay their discharge. To her credit, when I took sister the evidence, uh, she didn't stand in the way of what I wanted to do anymore. And I think um, what that revealed to me, I think, is that it, when there's scientific evidence behind our practice, whether it's clinical or in patient safety, we should really make the most of it. So it set me firmly on the path of evidence-based medicine uh, and that, that review actually turned out to be one of the first reviews for the Cochrane Anesthesia Review Group. But um, it also taught me that knowledge is a powerful ally in clinical and organisational life. Mm -hmm. And it also taught me not to take no for an answer as well. So. <laughs> Thank you very much for showing that research is actually not generally important but can also be a tool in daily life. Well, I think, I mean, one of the nice things about being able to be involved in the ESA's guidelines committee, for instance, was yeah. to make sure that the knowledge we have is, is put into practice. And I think that's a really important function of the society in, in general. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for this first round of, uh, of examples. And um, <clears throat> I think that probably for, for the audience, it, it has become clear that the, the, the Helsinki Declaration on Patient Safety and Anesthesiology is sort of a, a centerpiece for safety activities within the European society, besides all the other foundations uh, that Stefan de Heert has already mentioned in his, in his talk, education research. Um, could you think, and I, I'd like to start a more open conversation now, could you think um, on other examples of how the Helsinki Declaration can, can be used to make a, cha make a change at the cutting edge uh, of clinical work, especially of anesthesiologists, but also in the perioperative field. Please, Yannike. Yeah, well, 
I, I think what you can say is that it's a tool for the anesthesiologists out in the field that they can go to their administrators, to the politicians and so on, and, and to say that this is uh, the standard. You know, mm. this is the European agreed standard and it's being used that way. <coughs> uh, but I would also like to comment on what uh, Zev sa said about the second victim. Because what I have noticed is, of course, we share, as doctors, we share with the patients the same feeling when something has gone wrong. This must never happen again. And that's how we can make the partnership. If we deal with the aftermath of an accident in the right way, working with the patients and so on, it helps us heal and they help the patients and the relatives heal. And for that, we need practical tools. Because when a, 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 a error has happened or a, a mishap or a disaster has happened, we are so shaken that we don't know how to react properly. So to have those tools, and these are also described the, the comprehensive tool for how to deal with patient safety in the Helsinki Declaration. So we are in the same boat. Now we are launching the Helsinki Declaration follow-up project mm. together with the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, in the first example I gave to you, uh, how can the industry know that they have to uh, give us <coughs> sensors without rubber inside. We have to tell them. We have to work together. Mm. We have to plan together how to improve and to uh, avoid preventable, preventable death. This mm -hmm. is the first thing. The second thing is, uh, as I said before, regarding the human errors. Uh, because of stress, because of fatigue, because of uh, we have more and more operations uh, every day. So we, have to, we are not robots. And we have to improve and concentrate how to avoid these human errors. Because the equipment uh, is helping a lot, but uh, we, we have to uh, be very, very careful and concentrate when we work every day, because uh, anesthesiology is not only administering drugs, is to be prepared, like Steph said before, to react. There are anticipated problems and there are unanticipated problems. And these, uh, these problems, for, for this reason, I think anesthesia is one of the longest specialties uh, it takes many, many years to be an anesthesiologist because we have to be uh, a little bit cardiologists, neurologists, internal uh, doctors, internal medicine doctors, and so on and so on. Surgeons. And to combine all these, uh, these qualities. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yes. I, mean, I think, that, I mean, the vision, the, vision, the declaration is, is a set of practical tools, but it's also, it's also a, a vision set out for anesthesiology, um, originally in Europe, mm. but I think in the yes. same way that the, your, your movement invites people mm. to, to sign up and commit, um, we never actually done that formally, but it's interesting that about three quarters of anesthesia societies throughout the world have actually signed up yes. to it. So its reach has been much further than Europe. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I think within Europe, it sets out expectations and standards, which allows um, countries that aren't so well resourced something to aim for and something to take to their politicians and policymakers and mm -hmm. say, this is how we should be doing it. Mm -hmm. So it's about, um, it's about improving standards more generally as well, I think, especially uh, across the diverse continent that we, we're, we're in at the moment. Mm -hmm. Another th recommendation of the Helsinki Declaration was to, uh, for all departments to produce an annual uh, safety report. Um, and that would give them uh, at least once a year an opportunity to sit down and review what had happened over the last year. Uh, we asked them to maybe identify three incidents uh, that there was learning from last year and three ambitions for improving safety for next year. And this will uh, produce a process. But another, th another feature of the... Um, the ESA, which I'd like to mention, is international cooperation. Um, and uh, whenever, in any, any country in Europe, whenever the patient has a cardiac arrest, um, the nurse in the ward rings a telephone number to alert the resuscitation team. 
and uh, uh, different hospitals use different numbers. And uh, uh, two years ago, we did a survey, and 181 hospitals in Europe use 105 different numbers. And they're not numbers you'd think of, like 2222, 2444. They were 8169 and 7842, things that people couldn't remember. The, uh, the Danish uh, group did a survey. Only 60% of the nurses could remember the number in their own hospital to ring, and only 50% of the doctors. Um, so, and 80% of the people in the survey we did said we, they thought it should be the same number throughout Europe. And so, together with the European Resuscitation Council and the EBA, the ESA has recommended that all the hospitals in Europe should use the same number, double two double two. This is already uh, happens in the in the UK, the Republic of Ireland, uh, Denmark, um, uh, parts of Finland, all of Turkey. The health minister in Turkey recommended it, and last year Hermann Grohe, the German health minister, he wrote to all the German hospitals and recommend that they use it as well, and they're starting to use it. So this is something that um, other, other countries, Australia, parts of Australia use double two, double two. Uh, there's interest in South Africa, and maybe this is something that could work with the patient safety movement to develop a, an apps or something in the future. Well, thank you very much for these uh, inputs. In the meantime, um, a number of questions have been sent in. Uh, for example, uh, there's one about CRM. So CRM, Crisis Resource Management, a critical component of great providers has been shown to decrease morbidity and mortality. Can you share how we can make a movement to require all providers have CRM skills to save lives? It likely saved MRF's life. Well, the first uh, uh, patient, uh, Stefan de Head, has presented. Anybody wants to comment on that? Well, I mean, on crew resource management training, um, if you're talking about training a whole hospital or a whole health system, uh, that's possible. It's expensive. It's probably worthwhile. But I think sometimes with the patient safety stuff, it's easy to be daunted by the, the size of the task ahead of you. And very often, it's good to start small and mm. use th things that are already within your practice and just mm. augment them. So you're strengthening what people do already, really. And th what comes to mind with that is, is particularly with regard to the World Health Organization Surgical Checklist, in that it's been uh, mandatory in this country for a number of years now. And people do it, but they don't always mean it. Mm. And one of the things that you need to encourage people to do and encourage your colleagues to work within it to achieve is um, to make it work for them. And for instance, uh, this may be a British thing, but the first step is for everyone to introduce themselves. And... Hello, David. And... Ray, nice to see you. We're quite modest and we don't like to do that, but I actually think it's quite important because you need to know who everybody is. And it tells you, first of all, it says, what we're about to do isn't routine for the patients that are coming. It's very, it's, very, it's very special, it's very significant for them. It's not just a, it's not just a job as it is for us. And it, it's a moment just to remember, just to remember that. Mm -hmm. Everyone's name, you know who they are. It has to be proof against locum and agency and temporary staff, because that's uh, uh, all we rely on a lot. And immediately, if you make the most of those briefings and people understand what their roles are <coughs> and who you might need to turn to if things go wrong, it's not crew resource management as such, we don't call it that, but that's the same purpose. And we need to do what we do at the moment right and better before we start investing in bigger, bigger more expensive things, that's my view. Thank you, I think Yannick, you want to come? Yes, I, because I can come with an example from my own country, Norway, which you know is quite large and scarcely populated. And people get injured on the roads all over and the hospitals, some of them are very small and they don't see that many trauma patients. But then there's a low scale simulation, which is actually about team communication in the emergency room started several years ago. It's called best, best and systematic trauma uh, training. So that's being done. It's pure communication, just, uh, just training on a simple doll and uh, the communication. And that has spread throughout the whole system. And when it started in my hospital, we saw that the, how we received surgical patients or trauma patients became so much better that 
the, we started also with internal medicine and so on, and it started with pediatrics and so on, so that you could see the benefit in, and we can also see how we can use that simple training we do in the trauma room, in the operating theater, in the ICU, whenever there is a crisis situation. The same simple training has been used in Botswana, in Indonesia and all over, so it's, it's uh, feasible. Uh, for many situations, but we need to be aware of this uh, team communication skills. I, I would take it a stage further, and I think every morning before an operating list, the first five minutes, the team that are there that day should go through a quick scenario, anaphylaxis, malignant hyperexia, something like cardiac arrest. Uh, David Zeidemann, who organized the medical teams for the London Olympics, uh, they had teams of four people, a doctor, a nurse, physio perhaps, and every morning before, when they met, uh, before they started, they went through a little scenario uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that they were, you know, all on message and things. I, I, I used to meet all the patients that are scheduled for heart surgery mm -hmm. the, uh, in coming week. And uh, I have a meeting with them and I explain the, how is it going, anesthesia, the operation, the bypass, etc. And one, one guy asked me, uh, tell me, doctor, heart surgery is a, a very, very dangerous uh, procedure. And uh, why isn't it possible to choose people that will uh, uh, operate me and anesthetize me? So, you know, at the public hospitals, you cannot do it. So I said, I used again the example of aviation. I said, mm -hmm. uh, Flying is a very uh, problematic thing. It's, it's, it's very dangerous as well. And uh, you never know who is the pilot. Mm -hmm. But the company, if it's a serious company, uh, will designate uh, a, a person who is capable to do that, responsible for the flight. So is the name, the brand name, and the name, the prestige of the company the same as in, in our hospitals? Thank you, Zef. In the meantime, um, a number of other questions have come in, and I'm, I'm afraid we can't answer all of them. But uh, maybe just a very short answer, if you have one. Uh, there's, there's one um, saying, would you say operation in a small hospital is a risk, and if so, why are they still open? Is there a short answer to that? Um. Well, often it's local politics. Um, often the, look, in the United Kingdom, often the hospital is the biggest employer in the town. So the whole series of things like that. But there the have been uh, various studies. So maternity units, for example, um, if you go below 2,000 uh, deliveries, then uh, maybe the team isn't, isn't doing enough. And, and there have been some, uh, Andrew might like to tell us, there have been some um, uh, episode incidents in the United Kingdom and big, big reports into the maternity services and, and trying to rationalize those. And this applies. C pediatric cardiac surgery in this country, we probably only need three or four hospitals to do it. Um, I think there's about seven at the moment and there's a plan to, uh, to reduce them. So the surgeons can work in bigger teams, not just single, single mm -hmm. surgeons. And that again, all the perioperative care and everything is made much better if uh, 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 things are rationalized really. Thank you. You have a short answer yes, to that? Yes, I think it was very interesting what has been presented a couple of times here in the UK. The safest hospitals were not necessarily the biggest ones. Mm -hmm. So there are some benefits with smaller hospitals, of course, to a limit. So you have to tailor what you're doing to the size of your hospital. But we probably don't have a clear answer why they're still open, this was mm -hmm. the question. Very difficult um, question, of course. So I'm, um, I apologize, we're, we don't have enough time to uh, answer or discuss all of your valuable questions. Uh, may I ask a last round of our panel, ask the panelists to think about a, a take-home message for the audience. If you want to start, uh, Janneke. Uh, well, first, I feel I have to say, if you think my mother is a uh, uh, you know, a bad mother. She's not a bad mother. She did as good as she could. And I have told her when she has the bad conscience that 
I'm so happy I'm the person I am, and many others have benefited from our disaster, just so you know that. Then I want to say uh, with, my, with, the, with the, the patients and doctors together, for 20 years I tried to, to uh, make the politicians install this uh, investigation board as you have decided to do here in the UK. And it was very hard because doctors, we, are only, we have second agendas and so on. But then when there were patients and relatives hitting the headlines in the newspapers, then the politicians made their move. Another very good example on how we can create a union, a common goal with the patients and, and the relatives and go together to help uh, the politicians make the right decisions. Thank you, Janneke. Zef? Well, as I said, anesthesia is not only administering drugs. We are keeping the patient alive, and we are working uh, teamwork together with the surgeons, with the nurses, and the anesthesia is a peri-operative discipline. So we have to see the patient before the operation. We have to plan carefully our, uh, our work. We have to continue uh, with the patient during the operation, and the post-operative visit is, uh, is very, very important, and not always uh, we are doing it. So I think that uh, uh, our, our uh, specialty is a very integrated <coughs> discipline, which integrates a lot of uh, uh, aspects of medicine, and uh, uh, this is a, a very uh, responsible uh, discipline. Thank you, Dave. David, any um, message? Martin Bromley, who heard, spoke yesterday, said that standardization is an effective mechanism of reducing human errors in complex situations. And so standardization is my message. Uh, standardization of the labeling of the syringe, maybe even going to pre-filled syringes, so all the drugs are standardized with the ISO colored labels, uh, and standardize our uh, cardiac arrest telephone number to 2222. So uh, think global, act local. Thank you, David. Very clear. Andy, your message? Uh, I guess my, my message comes back to, to knowledge. Uh, and I mentioned research evidence earlier in the science, and that's important. But there are lots of other sources of knowledge we need to draw on to do the job right. and there the knowledge and experience of patients, for instance. There are also the knowledge and experience, uh, professional expertise that we all uh, use all the time, but we're not always aware of. And the standard operating procedures that Steph mentioned earlier, which allow you to work smoothly in an emergency without having to directly think about it. All these sorts of knowledge are there, and they all interact to, to provide safe, high-quality care. Muir Gray uh, was the chief knowledge officer of the National Health Service and, until a few years ago. And he said once, that knowledge is the enemy of disease. I think that's true, but I think in our context, knowledge is the enemy of risk. And the more we know, the better. Thank you. Also very clear. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, as we're coming to the end of our panel, I hope that we have been able to demonstrate that we as individual anesthesiologists and as a society don't accept fatal mishaps or complications as something inevitable. Medical and technological solutions are important, essential to um, advance patient safety, but their tools, tools uh, in the hands of professionals that who create patient outcomes at the clinical front line and, and on a daily basis. And um, the Helsinki Declaration <clears throat> is, is, is a tool that our society provides to help professionals to achieve our goal of eliminating preventable, preventable death and complications in our patients. Thank you. <clears throat>